Hey everyone, welcome to Mythology Explained. In today's video, we're going to be discussing Loki. Let's get into it. As capricious as the wind, as dependable as a guttering flame, and ultimately as devastating as an extinction level meteorite impact, Loki, the wily trickster, is an enigmatic figure in Norse mythology. He's counted amongst the Aesir gods, but he'll fight for the giants come Ragnarok. Despite his antics regularly miring the gods in predicaments, his cunning and cleverness usually extricates them before too much damage is caused, even creating profit for the gods on many occasions. But this pattern ceases to continue in the mythic future. In the end, the darker part of Loki's nature eventually wins out, and the trouble he causes precipitates the death of the gods and the destruction of the world during Ragnarok the great, ever-looming, all-consuming conflict. In Norse mythology, what tribe someone belongs to is contingent on their paternal pedigree. This is to say that people took after the father when being categorized. Most of the Aesir gods, the gods who dwell in Asgard, are half-giant, but despite their split heritage, are gods, not giants, because their fathers were gods. Similarly, those whose fathers were giants even if their mothers were gods, are considered to be of giant kind. That kinship was reckoned through the paternal line is why it is thought that Loki was a giant, despite him living in Asgard and being counted amongst the Aesir gods. His father was a giant called Farbauti, and his mother, called either Laufi or Nal, was of ambiguous descent, being either a god or a giant. Loki had two brothers, Bailist and Helblindi, though little is known of either of them, and he had five children. Two of them, Nari and Narfi, were human-like in appearance, and he sired them by his wife, Sigyn. The other three, Hel, who presided over the underworld, Jormungandr, the Midgard serpent, and Fenrir, a monstrous wolf, he sired by the Ogres and Grboda. We'll discuss these children in more detail later in the video as we unpack various aspects of Loki's story. Like Norse mythology as a whole, Loki's contributions can be divided into three parts, those of the mythic past, the mythic present, here meaning events that took place relatively recently, and the mythic future. And interestingly, it seems as though Loki's allegiance vacillated, changing from period to period. In the past, you could say he opposed the gods as he sired his trio of monstrous children, all of whom would prove instrumental to the destruction of Asgard and the world. In the present, he was more of a grey character that leaned slightly more towards good than bad. In this iteration, he simultaneously played the roles of both Breaker and Fixer, often embroiling the gods in different situations, but then, using his guile, disentangling and delivering the gods from those very same difficult situations. In the future, Loki reverts back to how he was in the past, reprising his previous persona bent on dealing death and destruction. He orchestrates the death of Baldur, the main event said to herald the coming of Ragnarok. He and Hel conspire to prevent Baldur from being resurrected, which would have potentially forestalled Ragnarok. The Midgard Serpent kills Thor, Fenrir kills Odin, and Loki leads the hordes of Hel against the gods during Ragnarok. When looking at all of the events in the aggregate, it's difficult to overstate Loki's role in the events leading up to Ragnarok and in the events of Ragnarok itself. From here, we're going to go over Loki's life chronologically, focusing on the most important moments in each time period. As for what happened in the past, we've mostly covered it. He sired three monstrous children by Angerboda, three godbanes that would wreak ruin upon Asgard in the future. Also, Loki and Odin were blood brothers, and presumably the ritual that bonded them in this way was carried out in the past. It is thought that Odin bonded himself in this way in an attempt to bring Loki into the fold to preempt the evil he would perpetrate in the future. In the present, Loki plays a central role in a broad array of miscellaneous myths. There's too many to cover with any semblance of comprehensiveness, so we'll just focus on a couple. In these, the pattern of Loki creating and then resolving problems will be apparent. The first that comes to mind begins with Loki shearing Sif's, Thor's wife's, golden hair. 
After much evading and eluding, Loki is eventually caught by Thor. Loki is able to avoid his well-deserved thrashing by promising to seek out the dwarves and have them craft new golden hair. In this venture, Loki is superlatively successful. Not only does he return with new golden hair, he returns bearing five additional treasures. Mjolnir, Thor's hammer, Gungnir, Odin's spear, Dropnir, a golden ring that replicated itself eight times every nine nights, Gulin Bursti, a golden boar that emitted light and could travel across land, sea and sky, and Skidbladnir, a ship whose sails were always pregnant with wind, and which could be folded up like cloth so that it fit in one's pocket. Another such myth centers on a giant smith soliciting his services to the gods, offering to build them an impregnable fortress, one that could repel any number of mountain trolls or frost giants. He claimed completing its construction would take only three seasons, so what he asked for as payment was exorbitant. His price was the sun, the moon, and the goddess Freya's hand in marriage. After taking some time to discuss the matter amongst themselves, the gods agreed, but only if the fortress was built in a single winter. They thought the terms impossible for any one person to meet, so there seemed to be little risk in betting such treasures. But the rate at which the giant raised the walls was astonishing, and it quickly became apparent that he was going to finish on time. Again, the gods convened their council, and, gathered as they were, came to realize that it was Loki who advised them to make the wager with the giant. With the blame laid at his feet, Loki was promised a bad death if the giant finished on time. He transformed himself into a mare and galloped to the quarry where the giant and his great horse went to gather stones. The stallion became mad with lust. He broke free of his harness and raced after Loki, and presumably there was more than just running that happened, because some time later, Loki birthed Sleipnir, the eight-legged horse that became Odin's steed. This delay cost the giant his payment. He flew into a rage and was killed by Thor. The mythic future is when things really take a turn for the worse, and terminally so. Baldur's death was the harbinger of Ragnarok, meaning it was of paramount importance that he not die. His mother, Frigg, went so far as to secure oaths from everything in all the Nine Realms. Literally everything. Fire and water, iron and all kinds of metal, stones, the earth, trees, diseases, animals, birds, poisons, and snakes. You name it. There was but one chink in his armor. Mistletoe was thought to be so innocuous that it wasn't worth bothering over, meaning no oath was secured from it. Baldur's virtual invulnerability became a source of sport for the gods, who would shoot, slice, and stab him with all manner of weapon, to no effect. Loki saw an opportunity to exploit this situation, and so began the downward spiral that would lead to his death, the death of the gods, and the destruction of the world. Under the guise of kindness, Loki involved the blind god Hod in the fun, but the weapon he gave him was a mistletoe projectile so that, when struck, Baldur fell dead. Hermod was dispatched to the underworld to implore Hel to release Baldur's soul, so he could be resurrected and Ragnarok forestalled. Hel agreed, but only if everything in all the world wept for Baldur, and to this end, the gods came tantalizingly close. But despite their best efforts, Thok, a cave-dwelling giantess, wouldn't weep, so Baldur remained lost. Thok is thought to be none other than Loki in disguise. At this point, having brought about Baldur's death and, subsequently, impeding the resurrection, Loki had pushed things too far, and he knew it. He fled and managed to hide for a while, but the gods eventually caught up with and captured him. Loki and his two sons were brought into a cave. One of the sons was transformed into a wolf and, in this form, ripped the other son apart. The entrails of the dead son were then used to bind Loki to three stones. A snake was placed above Loki's head so that its poison constantly dripped onto his face. Loki's wife held up a bowl to catch the venom as it dripped down, but every so often, the bowl would fill and need emptying. In her absence, the venom would drip onto Loki's face, 
and the pain was so excruciating that it caused him to writhe and convulse. It was thought that these especially torturous moments were what caused earthquakes, and in this state of perpetual anguish, Loki would stay, that is, until the onset of Ragnarok broke all bonds, allowing him to escape. Come Ragnarok, every manner of destruction becomes unleashed. The fire giants and the frost giants send their armies against Asgard. The sun and moon are devoured by giant wolves. The Midgard serpent drowns the world and kills Thor. Fenrir breaks free and kills Odin. The rainbow bridge that connects Asgard to Midgard shatters, and fire consumes what's left. Loki himself leads the hordes of hell against Asgard. His life is punctuated by a duel against Heimdall. They both claim each other's lives. Fortunately, Ragnarok isn't a true end. The next age rises up from the ashes of the old. The fires die down, the waters recede, and the world re-emerges fertile and revitalized. Some of the younger gods, like Thor's children, survive. Baldur and Hod return from hell, and the human race repopulates from a pair of people, one man and one woman, who managed to survive the cataclysm by hiding in Hodmimir's wood. And that's it for this video. If you enjoy the content, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. As always, leave your video suggestions down below.